Good morning, everybody. My name is Jens Chapman. Today is October 2nd, uh, 2020, and uh, a cordial welcome from Seattle. Um, uh, my name is Jens Chapman, as I mentioned, and today's topic of our Journal Club is going to be thoracic disc herniation, something that is still pretty um, unsettled um, in a lot of questions. We have three great articles and two cases, and I'm going to start things off with a little review. Before we get started, again, greetings to all of you around the world, and especially our good friends in Texas at the TBI. Um, tomorrow, October 3rd, we'll have the second annual motion preservation course chaired by Dr. Jack Ziegler and Scott Blumenthal. And we have a great faculty. It'll be in the morning here Pacific time. And I do uh, encourage you to go uh, log in and join us. We have, for instance, Dr. Rudy Bertagnoli uh, and many other great faculty members and we'll explore how we can maintain motion. So um, thank you, Dr. Ziegler. Thank you, Dr. Blumenthal. Dr. Blumenthal will be here to together with Dr. Kachatrian, and they're going to do some live demonstrations of state-of-the-art motion preservation. So please uh, join us. It's free. It's going to be superb quality, and it'll open your mind towards what is possible to avoid fusions. So thank you for that slide, and we'll show that one more time towards the conclusion of this tightly packed hour. Brief overview of thoracic disc herniations. So this is still something that is very difficult for us because it has a highly precarious neural element and a difficult to access anatomic area with precarious blood supply, especially in the mid-thoracic spine. And again, uh, it is a very rare entity. You'll hear some numbers later. The variables are what level it is, uh, whether the joint, uh, sorry, whether the uh, disc is uh, in the midline or posterior lateral, and what the neurologic structures are, whether this kyphosis and how many levels are involved, which in our clinical reality is a big deal, how big the patients are. And again, one of the particular problems is uh, if it's a giant disc, meaning more than 50% canal compromise, if it's calcific with uh, erosion and uh, with osteoporosis. So access incidents uh, are some of those mixes that make it very hard. They're rare. Uh, access can be very complicated, either from uh, the so-called anterior, that means lateral uh, aspects, or from posterior, where, where we can't obviously reflect the cord. So laminectomies and discectomies are not cool. And the outcomes in general seem to be good. We'll hear very critical reviews of three major articles from three of our wonderful fellows, but there's zero margin for error. So these are some of the numbers, and again, uh, men in their 40s and 50s are most affected. So uh, neuroimaging, MRI, obviously, and CT are two essentials. I personally still like CT myelograms far more because it gives me the, the most objective read on actual cord uh, compromise. And we do like motor exams, preoperatively SCPs and dermatomal SCPs, if available, are very helpful. Uh, and again, we do need to map the cord. We do need to understand cord pathology. And level counting is a big deal. That's a whole topic in itself. We've recently published a paper on preoperative level marking, but with intraoperative image guidance and intraoperative CTs, that's uh, far better. Uh, again, personally, I think CT myelograms, where you have the lowest cervical and the uppermost lumbar vertebra included, is uh, a definitive help so that you can uh, count levels. There are many more things in there. Again, you want to differentiate central from central lateral from foraminal discs, which is something that makes comparison to literature sometimes a little bit difficult because they're, again, unique aspects uh, of access and safety of resection. Uh, I'm not going to delve into, this is an old UW talk of mine, uh, the non-operative treatment, but one of the very big things is postural improvement where you get out of the thoracic slump and uh, you uh, reduce weight and you try to be careful with the activities, but you try to encourage patients to engage in meaningful aerobic conditioning. Uh, so there are some cases of soft disc herniations that have resolved. Uh, this is a good prompt for me to remind everybody that uh, soft disc herniations can, under certain circumstances, resolve, uh, and a CT myelogram is truly the more objective test to establish uh, true cord compression compared to MRIs, which are probably a little bit too sensitive. 
So indications of surgery are clearly myelopathy, recalcitrant radiculopathy, uh, or uh, if there's a concurrent kyphosis, there's a heightened awareness of this causing cord pinching, which can be dynamic. So postural films with upright x-rays is very important. Um, and again, classically, all of us were taught in my generation, certainly and I'm an older surgeon now, that anterior surgery was the only access. So a transthoracic, uh, more or less invasive procedure was the way to go to not um, deal with the cord, not retract the cord, et cetera. The posterior approaches would be transpedicular and transfacetal, and I had the great privilege at UW to be taught by the great late Alfred uh, Harris uh, how to do a transpedicular approach. He published those initial papers on how to do transpedicular discectomies. So the axis from posterior is actually posterolateral, and again, requires a certain degree of expertise and finesse to do this, as the great late Basil Alfred Harris had done. So this is a case, an example, and again, this is a patient, elderly male with uh, incomplete cord injury. The, uh, the uh, patient was probably waited a little bit too long, but there's a posterior decompression done, and again, these patients uh, can uh, proceed into significant kyphosis. Note that this patient has DISH, and this DISH herniation happened at the very lower end of this DISH formation. Um, so a laminectomy alone is usually not a good treatment. If you want to do a laminectomy, the uh, suggestion is to reinforce that with a uh, screw fixation and a posterolateral fusion and do it over multiple levels and try to straighten out the spine if you don't want to go ventral. So transthoracic is a gold standard, um, uh, especially for giant discs. It's usually very difficult to access the spine above T5. And again, the, one of the uh, uh, most significant things that we'll see in the literature correlation is access with level accounting intraoperatively. So this is not a very straightforward thing. We usually have to burr out the pedicle above and below and then try to core out and shell out the offending structure from the front, making it really thin so it can be broken out very carefully. It makes a lot of sense, but especially in larger patients, it can be a prohibitively difficult surgery, even with a high quality microscope and access tools. So the old days of the major thoracotomies are over, fortunately, but even with smaller retractions and more uh, sparing uh, uh, rib uh, spreader devices, uh, this is still a formidable procedure. This is the concept. Yeah, I again want to get through the pedicle, establish healthy cord above and below, and then shell out the offending structure uh, below. And you want to look to the far side of the pedicle to be sure that you're in there. And then usually you don't necessarily have to, if you leave half the virtual body ventrally intact, put a suitable graft in there. It should not be a poorly placed graft like uh, on the left slide. It should be properly decompressed to the far side of the pedicle. So reestablishing height uh, is also something that can be done from the front. And for grafts, uh, usually strut grafts, rib grafts, um, or iliac crest grafts historically, or allografts have been used and uh, are the gold standard. Uh, we used to use anterior plates uh, for these procedures. Uh, that's really fallen out of uh, use, but uh, certainly with less invasive procedures, some newer uh, tissue sparing and uh, uh, access sparing uh, options have become available. Uh, so these are not exactly straightforward, um, uh, but uh, they've been the gold standard. And again, dural tears in the front. I want to go back one slide here. If you have a dural tear and a pleural violation, which is common, you set the patient up for a potentially catastrophic, and I know of cases that have been fatal even, uh, um, uh, syringopleural fistula. So a dural tear and a transthoracic exposure with a pleural violation can be a very challenging issue, should be recognized and has to be dealt with very aggressively with appropriate lumbar drainage probably and a very strong attention towards dural repair. We can talk about that through in cases later. Endoscopy uh, by a former partner of our TBI friends, uh, uh, John Regan, has been heavily popularized. That probably has a role for soft disc herniations and more radiculopathy. I remain very uncomfortable in the presence of larger calcific discs as we see to recommend this. Uh, you'll see uh, later the transpedicular, transfacetal approach popularized. Uh, we wrote several articles in the UW days about this. This has also been popularized by uh, Chinese and uh, Korean colleagues. And again, I want to recognize uh, Basil Harris Harris's foundational work on this. Uh, these approaches basically do not require any form of cord manipulation. Uh, they access the cord posterolaterally, and we can then very carefully put a graft in there and do a short segment fixation. As
as was done in this 48-year-old male uh, with myelopathy. Um, the transthoracic discectomy, again, is a very formidable procedure. This is a large calcific disc of a 45-year-old female I treated years ago at UW. T7-8 uh, herniation location. Uh, this is a particularly challenging area because this is the watershed area of blood supply in the cord. They're going to be accessed this from the front and then did a posterior uh, surgery. Uh, so we, um, I'm going to bypass these results, but largely the results of the literature until more recently have been very, um, uh, very uh, kind of sporadic and case report based, so level uh, uh, four data or worse. Uh, this is a 34-year-old patient with multi-level thoracic disease, and she had a large disc herniation at the top. And again, this is a classic example of going in from posterior, where again, the posterior uh, lateral procedures have been clearly a breakthrough. We can, in a very controlled fashion, decompress and access the cord. So uh, before I surrender the field, and I think our first fellow is going to be Ravi Nuna, uh, the general outlay of the land is that thoracic disc herniations are a complex condition. Upper versus mid versus lower thoracic spine are significant differences in terms of access, and uh, our experience is largely indiv individualized. Uh, neurologic indications are pretty clear. Wrong level surgery in about 10% should be a thing of the past, and they're very narrow uh, margins for error. Error. So, Ravi Nuna is one of our great fellows. We're going to have three articles in quick succession. I'm going to unplug my computer, put on my face mask. And Ravi, you're first, right? Dr. Ravi Nuna, introduce yourself, if you will. Lee is coming to help with the access cable. Thank you, Dr. Chapman, for that very kind introduction. I'm just going to connect my laptop. So our first article is out, out of uh, clinical neurology and neurosurgery. It's out of the uh, Mayo Clinic group by Dr. Biden and his informatics lab. It's titled Anterior versus Posterior Approaches for Thoracic Disc Herniation and Association with Postoperative Complications. Uh, this was published in the last several years. So just to review some background information very briefly, and most of this Dr. Chapman has already touched on, but thoracic disc herniations constitute about 0.15 to 4% of all disc herniations. So it's a very, very rare pathology in general in the general population. And given the potential for both cord compression and neurologic compromise, and as Dr. Chapman stated, along with the anatomic and physi physiologic considerations in this area, not only is it an extremely narrow um, spinal canal diameter, but it's also the watershed area in terms of vascular supply for the spinal cord. Um, given all these considerations and factors, surgical intervention is both very challenging and complex, but also the treatment of choice, because this pathology is generally highly progressive in nature and simply doesn't resolve with time unless you are dealing with a very, very soft disc herniation. So historically, laminectomy was the most common strategy, but over the last several decades, this has fallen out of favor due to the high rate of complications, especially neurologic injuries. Uh, some series have showed up to a 33% rate of neurologic injury and even a 10% mortality rate. And it should be noted here that um, laminectomy with discectomy is generally um, contraindicated for thoracic disc herniations, but even laminectomy alone can be um, not suboptimal outcomes. So over the last 20 years, many new approaches have been developed with acceptable, acceptable functional outcomes. Um, these are pretty diverse and they're span from anterior to lateral to posterior. You have the transpedicular, transfacetal, costotransversectomy, extracavitary lateral approach, thoracotomy um, through a retropleural approach. Then you also have um, thoracoscopy. So previous investigations, um, the literature is generally scant or very limited just due to the rarity of the pathology. Most studies have been retrospective case series and generally out of a single institution. And they usually have a very, very small sample size. You know, you'd be hard pressed to find um, a study with more than 100 patients. Um, one, recent retro, um, one recent systematic review published in 2018 by Hurley et al. Uh, included 37 studies, about 1,200 patients. Uh, this study found no significant difference in neurologic outcomes. However, interestingly enough, a higher rate of complications in the anterior cohort. Unsurprisingly, this was uh, deemed primarily due to minor respiratory complications. Uh, one of our colleagues will be um, reviewing another systematic uh, review in a little bit. 
So for, for this study that we'll be reviewing out of uh, Dr. Biden's group, the method methodology was a retrospective reg registry-based cohort analysis. This was based on the Nesquib data file between the years of 2012 and 2015. So we're all aware this is one of the uh, national databases that's available for advanced analysis, and this data file was between 2012 and 2015. They used diagnosis codes, uh, more specifically ICD-9 and ICD-10 diagnosis codes, ICD-10 um, starting in 2015. And they used the diagnosis of displacement of intervertebral disc with or without myelopathy. So the procedure inclusion criteria, which you see here in table one, they included five different procedures, laminectomy, costotransversectomy, transpedicular approach, extracavitary approach, and the anterior approach. And they were able to specify all these different procedures because they are um, specified in CPT coding. Um, after they ran the initial query to extract the initial N for each of these um, procedures, they found that uh, the extracavitary and costotransversectomy cohorts are very, very small. So they elected to combine these, um, these cohorts into one and they deemed it a lateral approach. So the exclusion crit criteria for um, the study, prior operation within 30 days, chemotherapy within 30 days, radiotherapy within 90 days, age below 18 or above 90, um, and then any surgeons be, besides neurosurgeons or orthopedic surgeons, recent sepsis or a history of disseminated cancer were all exclusion criteria. The primary outcome variables were development of major complications within 30 days, and you have a large list of um, complications there, but generally um, deeper wound infections, um, respiratory complications, pulmonary embolism, stroke, heart attack, um, and then sepsis were all deemed um, significant major complications within 30 days. And then as a secondary endpoint, they also investigated minor complications within 30 days. That included unplanned readmission or return to OR within 30 days, DVT, UTI, superficial um, infections. And then also they looked at length of stay. So after extracting the initial data cohort, they've had um, 634 patients. And after applying the exclusion criteria, this was pared down to 388 patients. Uh, the groups were broken down into a laminectomy cohort, which is 199 patients, a transpedicular cohort, which is 90 patients, a lateral cohort of 34 patients, and an anterior cohort of 65 patients. Uh, the first statistical analysis was just, a was just a descriptive analysis of the demographics of all these cohorts. Interestingly enough, all these cohorts had um, no significant differences between the groups without any kind of matching that was necessary between these groups. And we'll get into it a little bit later, but again, um, I point to the sample sizes in each, in each group that um, some of them are quite small. But again, you, know, you have no significant differences in terms of uh, demographics. Uh, in, in terms of the actual operations, they found that operative time was significantly different, being the greatest in the anterior cohort. And I think um, you know, we'd all agree that that's generally unsurprising. Uh, in terms of the length of stay, this was also highest in the anterior cohort. And the anterior cohort also had the greatest rate of prolonged length of stay. Prolonged length of stay was deemed as greater than the 75th uh, percentile for this pathology. Uh, interestingly enough, the 30-day um, unplanned readmission and the 30-day return to OR was um, no different between these groups. Discharge destination was no different uh, between these groups. And then um, complication rate was also no different between these groups. However, the anterior cohort had a higher rate of complications, about um, you know, they found 12 complications or 27%, but given the N and when comparing these groups, this was not statistically significant. Um, after they stratified these complications by complication type, they found that there was no significant differences for any of the types except for um, pneumonia, which was most common in the anterior cohort. So again, um, we see those respiratory complications again. And in terms of minor complications, there was no difference uh, between these groups. Uh, multivariable logistic regression was performed, and the only um, statistically significant aspects were prolonged length of stay. Um, in comparison to the anterior cohort, the uh, lateral cohort, the transpedicular, and the laminectomy cohorts had between the 30 to 40 percent odds of uh, prolonged length of stay in comparison to the anterior cohort. 
So in conclusion, uh, the authors found that the anterior approaches had longer length of stay and higher, although not statistically significant complication rates. Um, there was no difference found in regards to discharge disposition. So I think um, you know, that, that summarizes their conclusions fairly well. I don't think that they overreached in their conclusions, but in terms of limitations of the study, um, you know, I think uh, it's important to kind of be aware that it is retrospective in nature. It is a registry-based analysis, so it is susceptible to miscodes, incorrect codes, and you're really at the mercy of the coders and their, and their, um, you know, their level of di diagnosis. There's also very limited follow-up for this cohort, and it's only 30 days, which is generally what Nesquip allows, which, um, you know, it, Many times it's not, you know, we like to look at either six months or one year or even longer than that for looking for long-term follow-up. That's something that this study lacked. I think the most glaring um, deficiency for this study is um, really due to the, the database that's, that's used, and that's the lack of neurologic outcomes, and that's something that we're not able to assess using this database. But um, obviously when we're assessing different procedures, I think that we would prioritize neurologic outcomes as, as the most important. So instead we're looking at a surrogate marker, which is um, perioperative complications and return, readmission and return to OR. There's also uh, a lack of diagnostic details. So there's no way of knowing if a disc herniation was calcified, the location, if it's central, paracentral, or all these important factors that can significantly change um, the surgical indications. So for instance, a calcified central disc may, would more frequently be treated anteriorly, and that's something that we're not able to deduce from, from this um, data cohort. And then finally, uh, this was also quite a small sample size for being a registry-based study. And I think the um, small cohort sizes in each of the specific groups, the anterior group is only 34 patients. I think that makes something that's um, hard to generalize to the, you know, to the rest of the population. But again, still an interesting study that I think is um, absolutely worth discussing. Thank you, Ravi. Great stuff. Um, I'm going to ask Lee to see whether they can fix that yellow background. That was not your choice of color. There must be some power plug. I'll ask Rick Sasso and Patrick Johnson to unmute their um, microphones. I have one question for you, Ravi. Um, I didn't see wrong level surgery. There was uh, years ago, a, uh, I think in our orthopedic yellow journal, uh, a survey article which identified a roughly 10% risk of uh, wrong level surgery. And uh, that's, again, where Dr. Oskuyan has a very nice paper of how to minimize that. Do you want to play with the, the plug right now? And I think we can plug in Elias's computer right now. I think he's switching. Uh, so my question to you is, did you find any mention of wrong level surgery in all these uh, different surgical types? So for, for this study itself, they had no mention of wrong level surgery, only because um, that diagnosis code isn't available as an indication for mm -hmm. return to OR or for any reason. So this study wasn't able to investigate that further. So Dr. Sasso, Rick, good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning. Good morning, Jens. You yes. sound great. Can you hear me? So nice to have you. So great offers a big picture perspective. As you know, I love you for so many reasons. You're just a, a large in life, highly pragmatic, highly skilled surgeon. Give us a little gestalt of anterior versus posterior. Should we individualize that? Uh, do you still do anterior surgeries? How do you tackle this problem? Yes, uh, and I would say anterior is my go-to because it's the most reliable way to decompress the spinal cord, and that's why you're there. Um, you can do it from a poster lateral approach or transpedicular, but you do not have the access that you have with an anterior approach. Hey, Jens, can I make one comment you uh, about wrong level? Because yes. that, I think, is the most important aspect of doing any thoracic operation. And here's the fundamental problem with uh, why surgeons get into trouble with thoracic operations is that all the MRIs, most MRIs are counted from top down. And when we're in an operating room, how do we count? We count from bottom up or from the ribs, right? So if there's any transitional uh, anatomy, we can easily get messed up. So what I do is, is I get an MRI scan counting from bottom up, and at the same time, I get a standing scoliosis or 36-inch X-ray so that I can see the, if there's any transitional uh, anatomy at the bottom and also 
what I'm going to call the 12th ribs, because that there's also associated with transitional lumbosacral anatomy, transitional focal lumbar anatomy. And that's usually where we're counting from, from the ribs or what we think are the 12th ribs. So that needs to be all delineated very, very clearly before you go in the operating room. The worst place to try to figure this out is in the operating room. So figure it out the night before. Great, great points. Uh, do you use uh, fiduciary markers? Do you put any things like these little CT-based pebbles in before? Nothing like that? No, because that can, that can confuse you as, as well. The okay. most important thing for me is knowing what I am calling the 12th ribs and, and being able to see that intraoperatively and then counting from there up. I think, uh, thank you for highlighting that point, because this, for me, uh, next to neurology and preservation of neurology and highly calcific, very large discs is the paramount problem. And I missed that in that paper, totally. They didn't mention that. And in a much smaller series, retrospective series at Harborview, we did have a problem with anterior procedures, exactly what you said, trying to count around from the inside and just being lost, and interoperative x-rays don't work. One quick follow-up question. Do you use anterior plates? Do you use anterior grafts if you have to resect too much of the vertebra? Uh, if I'm just doing a discectomy, no. Uh, mm -hmm. If I'm doing a, a corpectomy or more, yes, I'll put a plate on. Okay. Thank you. Patrick, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hello, Hello clear. Yeah. Good morning. Wow, you're, you're just as dark uh, in your window as we are here. Same time zone. Good morning to you. Patrick, so you're in a highly competitive market there in L.A., and uh, you have one of the uh, original propagators of thoracoscopic uh, discectomies there. Um, tell us a little bit about less invasive and high-tech approaches, i.e. Uh, image guidance systems to try to solve the problem of getting an effective and safe decompression of the thoracic cord. Wow, thank, thank you very much for asking me to talk about this. In fact, I, I made a special change in my schedule just so I could come and listen to this today. I didn't know I was gonna get to talk. Um, we love doing thoracic disc surgery. It's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, I appreciate what Rick said about localization and er everybody needs to develop their own scheme to make that 100% and, and have a zero tolerance for, uh, for doing a wrong level. Um, there's a few ways that we do that, kind of with the minimally invasive things that we do. And uh, interestingly, I got a paper in review right now of about, I don't know what, 250 thoracic disc cases that we've done. And kind of looking at it generation, generationally is that we started doing this thoracoscopically. John Regan came to LA when I was doing them. And so we had a lot of experience together. Uh, but I kind of moved on to the computer guidance side and that when we had the initial computer guidance, which we had point matching, and now we got third generation basically of thoracoscopic surgery. And we do most everything from the front for big surgery or for big problems uh, that need to be done from the front. I mean, if somebody has something that's simple from the back, we do it from the back. I don't do anything really from the side like costotransversectomy. Uh, we do a lot of thoracoscopic work. Uh, the thoracolumbar junction, we will uh, do as many opens just because it's easier to deal with the diaphragm and just the space and the costophrenic angles and things like that. So we use the image guidance system for virtually every single thoracic case that we do. And we've been doing that for uh, 15, maybe 20 years. And so it has turned it into a very precision procedure Localization is absolutely automatic now. In fact, we did a um, we did a tumor in the foramen of T70 just this week. We put a clamp on the patient. We did it in a prone position because it was in the foramen, so we did it posterior laterally. Uh, but that's the automatic registration. We know where we are. There's a big foramen. You know exactly where it is. So localization is done. I mean, so when you use an intraoperative CT scan and navigation. Um, for doing the biggest discs that you could imagine, and like the big one that you showed, a big calcific disc with a high risk problem, I believe that doing them through the front side, if they're really big and a high grade neurologic problem, I will do some of those open still. But I would say about 90% of what we do, and we've done them all the way up to T2, we'll do them with the uh, endoscope, with navigated uh, instruments. So we're actually tracking the tip of the drill. So we're looking at it on an endoscopic monitor. We're looking at it on a navigation monitor. So we have everything dialed in possible that we can do for safety, precision, uh, and, uh, and accomplish the desired outcome. 
the uh, the idea of doing fusion, I have to write that paper because I don't do fusions in thoracic disc surgery, even with great big calcific discs like the ones that you showed, Jens, because we can do it so precision that we go in and drill out the pedicle, we undermine the spinal canal, and the size of the bony decompression is about the size of a nickel, at biggest, maybe a quarter. So. I believe that if you don't disrupt uh, anterior longitudinal ligament, which you're nowhere near, posterior lateral, all the other things, you're boring a hole, you're making the foramen bigger and you're undermining the spinal canal. So it's an extreme <coughs> precision procedure what we do. And uh, it, it makes it to where we almost never say never, but almost never need to uh, uh, do a fusion. And we never put a graft in, I don't put plates in. I mean, we can go decompress somebody because they very rarely need it. I mean, if somebody, has a big problem with a tumor or something like that's a different problem. But calcific discs, you know, we do them all with the endoscope. I'm, I'm sorry to dominate your discussion here, but no. I but no, thank you. I, I had I to put that in because so, I have thank both, you both to you and for Rick a follow-up question about a certain complication later. So enjoy your breakfast, Elias. Elias, introduce yourself, and he's going to talk about posterior surgery since you made such a pitch for anterior surgeries, both of you. So here's a repartee from Elias Elias. So good morning, my name is Elias. I'm a neurosurgeon from Beirut, Lebanon, and uh, I'm currently a spine fellow here at Swedish. I will present an article uh, that was published in 2010 by Dr. Chapman and his colleagues. Uh, it's entitled, Early Experience Treating the Thoracic Disc Herniations using a modified transfacet pedicle sparing uh, decompression and fusion. So this article was published in 2010 in uh, Journal of Neurosurgery Spine. So uh, rare facts about uh, thoracic uh, disc herniation, the incidence uh, is really low, and it is reported to be between 0.25% and 0.75%. Mainly, not all the patients who have thoracic disc herniation are symptomatic. Uh, the ones who are symptomatic or who present to clinic uh, are one patient uh, per million in the population. And most common uh, presentation of the anatomic uh, thoracic disc, disc herniation is between T8 and T12 area. So this entity is progressive uh, if it is untreated, uh, hence the benefits of early operation. Uh, surgical approach might be difficult due to the adherence uh, of the disc to the ventral dura or due to intradural penetration. And uh, this surgery is associated with uh, multiple uh, complications, mainly neurological deterioration, dural tear. And as Dr. Chapman said, we can have a subarachnoid pleural fistula, especially in the transthoracic approach. So multiple approaches were described in the literature. Uh, we have the dorsal midline, the transpedicular, uh, the costal transversectomy, and even the lateral extracavitary approach. So the objective of uh, the authors uh, was to assess the outcomes and complications uh, in their series for patients uh, with thoracic disc herniation who underwent a modified posterior transfacet decompression and uh, fusion. Again, uh, so they describe the different techniques. Uh, here you have the costal transversectomy. Uh, here you have the transpedicular approach. Uh, and here we have the transfacet pedicle sparing, but with the hemilaminectomy, uh, I mean, uh, with the laminotomy. And uh, this one is uh, their technique, which is a transfacet pedicle sp uh, sparing with a hemilaminotomy, hemilectomy. So uh, this, regarding this paper, it was a retrospective paper that included 18 patients uh, over five years span, uh, who had, uh, and the patients all had a transfacet, modified transfacet pedicular sparing approach. So uh, Dr. Chapman and his colleagues uh, described their technique, uh, prone position, uh, superosteal dissection, we exposed the bilateral laminas, then uh, we go, we do uh, bilateral hemilaminectomies. We remove the IAP, then we, re we remove the SAP. Here there is a description of a unilateral side, but we can do it bilaterally. Uh, once we do this, we will have a full exposure 
like oblique exposure regarding the disc anteriorly. And then uh, they described how they do the discectomy and they do the disc insertion. So here again, you can see the dura. This is the dura. This is the dura over here. And here you have the disc and you will have, this is a screw and you will have uh, the root coming out of here. So regarding the results, uh, they included 18 patients. Uh, the mean age was around 50 years. Uh, 11 were men, seven were women. Uh, most of them presented for thoracic myelopathy and the duration of symptoms was between two months to two years. Uh, nine patients had one level thoracic disc herniation while, while the other nine had multiple levels uh, thoracic disc herniation. Uh, so regarding uh, the blood loss, the average uh, estimated EBL was uh, 870 mils. Uh, they had no dural tears for the 18 patients, and the average uh, or the mean uh, length of stay was around four days. None of the patients had neuro deficits, and the neuric grades was uh, around 2.5 pre-op, and it, uh, it, it went to 1.9 post-op. Uh, the average, and they had also an average decrease in BAS score from 59 to 21. Uh, 12 out of the 18 patients had uncomplicated post-op course. Six had complications, but they were not major complications. Most were uh, due to infection. One patient had uh, screws that were uh, misplaced and they had to revise the instrumentation. So regarding uh, the modified transfacetal approach for thoracic disc herniation, uh, uh, the authors, uh, so the, the authors discussed that their technique that it is uh, an acceptable one for patients who present with myelopathy, radiculopathy, and persistent axial pain. Uh, so, uh, going back to history for the thoracic uh, disc herniation, as Dr. Chapman said uh, earlier on, initial attempts uh, were uh, for decompression uh, was done via a laminectomy. However. Uh, However, uh, the results were not ideal, and uh, the complication rate of paralysis alone or paresis was around 30%. Then after the posterior laminectomy came the transthoracic approach, uh, which would permit uh, an easier access to the ventral dura. However, this technique is not free of complications. I will not go over those complications, but you have uh, cardiac, pulmonary, paralysis, dural tear, hernia, so also this technique is associated with a lot of, hernia, of uh, complications. Uh, hence the shift from the transthoracic to the posterolateral approach. So for the posterolateral approach, you have the transpedicular or the pedicular sparing <coughs> transfacetal uh, approach. Uh, the transfacetal approach will offer a simpler and less of invasive operation compared to the transpedicular. Uh, especially, it will preserve the pedicle and uh, it will spare the patient from having axial pain post-op. So, hence, it will, uh, it will decrease the length of stay, it will decrease the administration of pain medications, and it will decrease DVTs and all the associated uh, complications in the hospital. Uh, as I said, so Dr. Chapman and his colleagues, they described a unilateral approach in their uh, paper, but you can do it bilaterally. And after doing this, you will have direct oblique exposure for the ventral, uh, for the ventral cord. So if you have a, a, a central uh, disc herniation, you will be able to access it uh, by doing a bilateral exposure. Uh, and, you do, and you don't always have to, uh, to remove the disc, especially if the disc is, uh, is uh, invaginated in the dura. Uh, so we, you can just free it and keep it as a floating disc. Great. So take home message, uh, transfacetal, uh, pedicular sparing has a good outcome. It's a safe technique if you know what you're doing and it can be a, an alternative to the transthoracic or transpedicular posterolateral postero approach. So thank you Elias, thank you. we'll get the next talk ready. <clears throat> 
Rick Sasso, so you see where my position stands in this um, highly anecdotal uh, eminence-based uh, article. I obviously like the posterolateral approach and I continue to, in my hands, find this very good. I'm going to show a case where I had a deterioration later, to be fully honest. But here's my question to you. So I know you are a superbly skilled surgeon like Patrick. You could do surgery on me or my family any time. If it were to happen, and it is known, especially in calcific discs, that this is a possibility, that you have a dural tear with CSF leakage in an anterior procedure, transthoracic, and that theoretical thing, I know it wouldn't happen to you, what would you say to try to avoid that serious problem of a syringopleural or meningopleural fistula? Yeah, so that's a great question. First, uh, Jens, congratulations on that uh, on that manuscript. I mean, that those are some really good results. But obviously, you are a master surgeon, and you can you you have a great ability to be able to do this operation from um, a posterior lateral approach. And I think most surgeons, though, have a more difficult time assessing the 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 dura and the compressive lesion because it's not usually just this thing that's sitting in in front of the spinal canal, the dura is draped over this, especially if it's a calcified disc herniation, the dura is around this. So it's really difficult, especially from a posterior lateral approach, to get around the dura, anterior to the dura, and then get this thing. It's like a water balloon with a rock in the in the middle of this uh, of this water balloon. So you have to be a absolutely technically superb surgeon to do what you just showed. Um, but Talk about dural uh, defects and dural tears. I've actually had these in, in the past for, from the front. Thank goodness I've never had a uh, w what you describe as this uh, dural pleural fistula. And usually, and I'll tell you my technique, I take a thrombin-soaked gel foam and I flatten out to get all the, the thrombin out of it and use that little thin piece to just put over, over the defect. And I've not fortunately not have ha had any problems. And I do that also. I've had a number of intradural calcific disc herniations where I had to do a durotomy to take the, the disc herniation out. Uh, same, s same thing. Uh, just, just, just put a, put a, th a thrum and uh, a gel foam over the top of it. And I've not had any, any problems with that. Outstanding. Um, uh, Patrick, anything to add to that? So uh, again, do we have to maybe address the floating decompression? I think we'll see a case of that later. Is that something that um, is reasonable? And uh, especially to add to what Rick said, uh, there are these weird disc herniations. I'm sure you've seen that, Rick, also, where you have this horseshoe kind of a draping. So it's not just a single lobular kind of indentation. It kind of makes this little crimp in there. And the actually folds around it. So how do you address um, completeness of decompression uh, as an intuitive desire, intuitively desirable thing versus a floating decompression and leaving a little bit incomplete uh, on the dura? Thanks, Patrick. Um, thanks, uh, Jens. Uh, hang on, I got the OR calling me, so I'll put them on. Um, so calcified disc, and I go back to the case that you showed, Jens, that one that looked like a mountain. Okay, that's a great case. And I believe in visuals like that, so people can look at them, is that I expect that that case is going to have the uh, calcified disc growing through the dura, and I expect to see CSF in those cases. Okay, and that doesn't worry me, it doesn't bother me. Um, we've never had a catastrophic problem. I have taken back in the 20 years probably about three or four patients that had a persistent leak. And we've probably seen, uh, you know what, I've never quantified it, but probably 20, 30 plus uh, CSF leaks in the front of the spine. And, you know, we manage them and we do them through the chest, either open or endoscopically. And you create your usual, kind, what I consider a usual plug. We use a little muscle, we use some glue. Um, I have stitched a couple of them up when I took them back as an open, but most of them you can basically create a plug, a fibrin biologic plug. Um, if you need to, you can put a lumbar drain in the patient. Another very, very, very important tactic is to reinflate, have the anesthesiologist reinflate the lung and have a chest tube in the patient and never put the chest tube on suction except for the first uh, hour 
so the lung reinflates and the lung pushes up against the uh, against the uh, uh, potential CSF leak site and that stops it is that if you don't have negative pressure inside of the chest and if you think it's bad enough put a lumbar drain in it solves all of them okay CSF to me CSF leak is not a problem it's not a catastrophic problem it's actually an everyday occurrence in patients that like the one you showed I just expect that's going to happen and that's why I don't worry about going from the front side and I, I do those very comfortably so I want to just publicly share thanks I'd answer uh, a question by the great Dave Polly from Minnesota he asked uh, and this is pertinent to Rick but maybe you can address it also um, can you set up a patient right away after you had a defect obviously if a lumbar drain and you you're not going to do that, but address mobilization. Maybe Rick can add to uh, his post operative protocol so that all the over 100 attendants now can hear that. So, mobilization after an anterior dural defect that you couldn't repair. Patrick, do you want to take it first? Sure. Me? Rick, go ahead. Yeah, so as I uh, uh, typed in, um, I keep them flat over, overnight, and then the next morning, uh, slowly start sitting them up. Uh, and then if they don't have a headache and I've not really, I've not had one, uh, I let them get up out of bed. And I, uh, I, I totally agree with what uh, uh, Dr. Johnson has said about, about these dural, dural defects anteriorly. Super. Let's so, go. so Jens, can I comment on Please. lumbar drain management? Yes. Okay, I, I'm obsessed about this and we actually have a protocol is that, uh, and I even have a patient in the hospital right now that had a horrible dural problem after a lumbar laminectomy with a bunch of defects and I just basically had to put some, put some, uh, some dural graft in and lay it on and put glue and put a lumbar drain in. Is that I keep the lumbar drain running at uh, plus or minus 10 cc's an hour, never ever close the drain clamp the drain, okay, that's not allowed. I let the patient out of bed. She was sitting in bed yesterday after surgery on Tuesday. I let her walk to the bathroom. I don't keep them in bed at all, zero. Is that you have to keep the lumbar drain open because if you clamp it, they're gonna blow out wherever the, your repair is. And so that's something we've been doing as a protocol for the 19 years I've been at Cedars is that never clamp a lumbar drain. You can adjust the height up and down. If they drain 20 cc's one hour, it's okay. You just adjust it to where it's back to around 10 cc's an hour. Patrick, can I challenge you and Cedars to give us a dural repair and CSF leak management journal club at one future point in time? Sure. That'd be great. I'd be happy. I'd be happy. It, it's purely anecdotal. I've never published it, but it actually fine. is one that. That's fine. Uh, as I said, I'm obsessed about it, and um, we don't have problems. Let's share that with the world. Uh, I have a question from. Uh, we have a moment. Uh, please. Uh, one of my partners, Raj Arakal, has some good, good experience uh, with thoracic disc, uh, and we just unmuted him. You have a just a minute for him to pipe in. Uh, I, Jack, I appreciate it. Can can you? Uh, uh, hey there, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, hearing me out. Um, yeah, I'll I'll show my video here. So uh, great conversation, great concept. Uh, one thing I will say is we've been using um, you know navigation with the arrow CT and a couple of pearls just to address the uh, the uh, level issue. We we scan um, from you know the top of the cervical thoracic junction down to the ribs so we can always uh, confirm and we usually get a CT myelogram uh, again because of the specific uh, condition of one of the biggest concerns was the um, location of the herniation um, so that's one thing and then the other thing we found that the we use the uh, navigation piece with the intraoperative CT very very helpful uh, we do a lot of these posteriorly uh, essentially kind of a glorified transfacetal type decompression Early on, about 10 years ago, I visited Germany with Jürgen Harms, and he had described some of the calcific uh, herniations that he had addressed, and you're essentially creating this kind of cavity below the, um, below the herniation. And with the navigation piece, you can actually articulate exactly where you need to be uh, with a lot more precision, as, as uh, Patrick had been describing, that the, the navigation piece has been really a godsend for approaching these. Um, and, and there is an element uh, where you can do the scan after and you can check with the pointer uh, where your trajectories are and, and essentially have a, a good assessment of the amount of decompression that you've created. Can you, hey Raj, can you address um, when you fuse and when you don't fuse? 
So in, in these, especially in the one level, you know, when we look at the risk and benefits, um, I, I've tended to do a like a when you're doing a poster lateral fu uh, poster lateral approach. I've I've tended to do a like a singular level fusion. In the thoracic spine, I think the risk and benefit of a one level fusion is a fairly low downside. The benefit is we usually stabilize the contralateral side of the decompression first. Um, so that way, we, especially if you're trying to get after like a calcific component, you can be fairly aggressive in, in kind of doing a downward push and you have a intrasegmental stability that you've created uh, intraoperatively, which, which I think helps you rather than hurts you, uh, especially from a neurologic side. So Thanks, great, Josh. great observations. Thank you, uh, Rahesh, for sharing that. Uh, last article will be from Dr. Sven Freeler uh, on a big picture systematic review uh, to kind of help us uh, form opinions. We have a number of questions from the chat room, including from our good friend Marcelo Valico from Buenos Aires. Shout out to Marcelo. We'll hopefully get to that. Also, Stephen Ditzman, I think your question about back pain will be addressed in the systematic review. Sven, take it. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Sven Freela. I'm a research fellow here at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute. I'm originally from Germany, where I'm a resident at the University Hospital Bergmannsheil in Bochum. Today at our journal club, I'm presenting surgery for giant calcified herniated thoracic disc, a systematic review. Um, it was published in World Neurosurgery in 2018 by Gonk et al. Um, the giant calcified um, herniated thoracic disc, HTD, um, is a rare disease and challenging for surgeons because of its complications. This review aimed to confirm the surgical treatment, uh, including surgical approach, results, and complications. Before going into more details regarding giant calcified um, HTDs, we need briefly to talk about herniated thoracic disc in general. They are usually detected on MRI, which shows them also in up to 37% of asymptomatic persons. HTDs often present with axial pain and or pain irradiating um, to the lateral or anterior thorax or abdomen, and progressive myelopathy like sensory disturbance, weakness, bowel or bladder dysfunction and also as acute myelopathy. Um, the exact pathophysiology of uh, symptomatic HTDs remains unknown and symptomatic HTD usually um, requires surgical intervention. In 2005, Hot et al. were the first to define giant HTDs as occupying at least 40% of the anterior posterior diameter of the spinal canal based on examination of CT myelopathy, myelography, sorry, MRI or both. They are divided in three subtypes, a dense calcification, partial calcification or soft, which are actually known to often develop into calcification. Giant calcified HTDs occurs in 76 to 95 percent of all giant HTDs and they belong to the subgroup of high risk as they are frequently leading to development of myelopathy. Um, therefore, most of the surgeon actually recommend surgery. The surgical approach, uh, approaches involve the anterior approach, like for example, thoracotomy, mini thoracotomy, and thoracoscopy, and posterior lateral approaches like cost, uh, cost, costotransversectomy and transpedicular, as well as posterior approaches like laminectomy or posterior bilateral um, total facetectomy. Major surgical complications of giant calcified HDs include CFF, CSF, fistula, and neurologic impairment because they may adhere to the dural or already intruded. However, there's a scarcity of high quality studies on giant calcified HDs, which makes it difficult to establish an evidence based treatment algorithm. Um, okay, let's move to the methods. Um, this investigation was performed at the Department for Orthopedic Surgery in West China Hospital, Sichuan University in Chengdu, China. Um, the systematic review complies with the PRISMA guidelines and involves a search of PubMed, Enbase, and Cochrane. Inclusion criteria were patients with symptomatic calcified, a giant calcified HDD, treatment was operation, patient age over three years, the follow-up, the average follow-up six months, and at least one of the following outcomes was present. Surgical approach, results of neurologic impairment, including pre-operation and post-operation, and surgical um, complications. On the right side um, of the slide, we see the flow chart um, by the group. Uh, initial 136 papers were identified after removing duplicates 
111 were left. The authors then excluded that um, according to the title and abstract so that a full text, so that 45 full text article were assessed. Uh, furthermore, the authors excluded uh, papers with no data for, of giant calcified HCDs, insufficient data, um, less than three patients, overlapping cohorts, and review articles. So that overall, so that overall. Um, uh, so that overall 11 papers were included. Two authors independently reviewed all titles. In case of a disagreement, a third author was consulted to reach the final decision. Um, I'm presenting the final result table in two parts. The first one includes seven of the 11 papers. Don't be afraid, I won't discuss them in detail, but just describe the exact data. Um, I'm trying to activate my pointer. So first we see the authors, followed by the nation of the first author, um, types of study, um, retrospective or prospective, the number of patients and uh, sex, average age, disc level, site of disc, um, paracentral or central, transdural, which means transdural herniation of the disc, um, uh, neurologic impairment, myelo, which means myelo, uh, myelopathy or radiculopathy, um, approach for surgery, then uh, if neuromonitoring monitoring was available and the follow-up time. Um, there were no level one or level two evidence study. The number of patients across all 11 studies comprise um, 164 patients, including th uh, 83 female and 81 male. Um, age range was from 21 to, eight, uh, to 81 years. Um, regarding the location, there were two in the upper thoracic spine, um, 38 in the middle thoracic spine, and 99 in the lower thoracic spine. Uh, regarding the study design, only one was prospective. Uh, Gonke et al. noted that transdural herniated disc amounted for 47 patients overall. A total of 145 patients showed myelopathy. Um, approaches. Um, the review included several surgical approaches um, for anterior, posterior, lateral, and posterior approach. I already mentioned them before, so I will go on to the next slide. Um, the review included several, uh, sorry, yeah, and the pre presented neurological outcomes and changes um, to present neurological outcomes and changes. And the authors evaluated the used grading system before operation. 140 patients were graded using uh, the Frankel grading system and the American Spinal Injury Association impairment scale. And in addition, 84 patients were graded by the Japanese Orthopedic Association scoring system. We focus on the red marked area, which shows the final follow-up. We notice improvement in 100 patients which is 69% um, of the cohort size, unchanged in 34 patients, and worsened in five. According to the Frankel grading system and the American Injury Association impairment scale, the neurologic grade following the Japanese scoring system were excellent in 24 patients, good in 20 patients, fair, fair in 17, unchanged in 16, and worsened in seven. Remembering the first slide, the authors aimed to determine the original surgical, uh, the optimal surgical approach for giant calcified HTDs and the neurologic impairment change after the operation and the complication of operation. The surgical approaches available are categorized in anterior, posterior, lateral, and later and posterior approach, um, with the different sub cohorts. Um, I will uh, skip to the discussion. We will talk about this table. Um, in this review, 68 patients were treated with the anterior open thoracotomy approach, um, which had a high rate of complication to, uh, related to the open thoracotomy. Um, but low complication of neurologic deterioration and CSF fistula. And in addition, a low rate of uh, reoperation. Only four patients underwent reoperation. To reduce the complications of open th uh, thoracoscopy, surgeons developed the mini thoracoscopy approach. Um, the authors observed a markedly higher number of transient and neurologic decline, but no permanent injury, and also low number of CSF and, re and reoperation. Um, obviously, obviously, the cohort of posterior lateral and posterior approaches showed good results and revealed um, low rates of complications. However, the author encouraged the reader to interpret these findings with caution, um, with caution because of the relatively small number and possible section bias, um, selection bias. It is um, difficult to use this approach um, for central broad-based uh, calcified HDDs, which are frequently observed with, um, pre 
frequently observed with presented complications in the table. Um, therefore, surgeons would prefer to select patients with relatively smaller eccentric HDDs with no serious attention and no intradural disc, which could, which could, could cause the mentioned uh, selection bias. Um, following the argumentation, a posterior lateral or posterior approaches theoretically increase the rate of impairment of spinal cord um, injury, but still has the following main indications. Um, relatively small eccentric, no serious attention and no interdual disc, and patients with poor physical condition and respiratory function. Um, the presented review supports the thoracoscopy remain a huge challenge and noted high complications for neurologic deterioration. Two out of eight experience neurologic impairment. Um, however, thoracoscopy has a steep learning curve. Um, with high level of experience, this technique may be very useful. Um, summarizing the findings, the authors described uh, the open thoracic approach as kind of gold standard. They underlined the possibilities of resection the two adjacent vertebral bodies um, to create space for direct visualization of the disc and the dural sac without manipulation, um, which leads to a decrease in spinal cord impairment. And in addition, the surgeon had the widest vision um, for the repair or reconstruction of the dura, respecting that the transdural and respecting that the transdural um, and adhesive nature of the giant calcified HDDs frequently result in durotomy or rupture of the dura. Conclusion, in conclusion, um, surgical treatment for giant calcified HDDs can improve and stabilize the neurologic impairment for most patients. The authors recommended the anterior thoracotomy approach due to its theoretical advantage over the other approaches and low rates of neurologic um, deterioration, CFS, fistula, and reoperation for surgical decision making. A more comprehensive surgical risk classification and grading system is required. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sven. This is a tour de force. We won't have time for a discussion, uh, but I appreciate your review. Uh, may I ask Dr. Jack Ziegler, the chairman of tomorrow's second annual motion preservation course, to take us out from here and close us out? Uh, Jens, thank you very much. You know, you had short notice to put this together, but you did your, uh, your usual phenomenal job. But hopefully everyone uh, can find some time to join us tomorrow for uh, a great course. Um, that is unique because it does involve um, uh, live dissections uh, with uh, in, uh, talking back and forth uh, between the dissectors, the moderator, and the audience. So uh, uh, we invite everyone to spend a few hours with us tomorrow. Thank you, and thanks to Seattle Science Foundation, Swedish Neuroscience Institute, and everybody have a good weekend. See you tomorrow. Thank you. That's great, Jens. Outstanding. Thanks for joining us. Great case. Great 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 topic. Guys. Take care, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.